Please open your Bible to the book James. Find chapter 5, James chapter 5. We're going to look at verse number 11. And then we're going to move over to the book of Job and read a passage, two verses, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 42. So first James and then Job. James chapter 5 and verse 11. The Bible says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And now to Job chapter 42. Let's look at the end of the Lord in his story. How it all turned out for Job. The Bible says in verse 12 of chapter 42 in the book of Job. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep before he had seven. And 6,000 camels before he had three. And a thousand yoke of oxen. And before that he had 500. And a thousand she asses. And before that he had 500. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And before that he had seven sons and three daughters. What happened? He got double everything else. Why didn't he get double kids? Well, he did get double kids. He's got 10 of them in heaven. And he got now 10 more on earth. Amen. Father, I want to thank you so much for the encouragement we find in this book, which really, it would seem on the surface, is a very discouraging book. But it's not, is it? Help us to see how the great story of Job reveals your pity and mercy. In Jesus' name I pray and ask for that. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We continue our series, Know Your Bible Insights. Our desire is that as we go through each of the major stories of the Bible, God will communicate insights to your heart from His Word that will help you, that will strengthen you, that will give you what you need for your daily journey. For those times in your life when you wonder, what is God up to? Or when you wonder, what's going on in this world? In one day, Job's children were all killed. In one day, the same day, all his possessions were robbed. And in that same day, his health was lost. And while sitting in ashes, scraping the itching and inflamed boils that covered his body, his wife provoked him to just curse God and die. Three of Job's friends and a young man named Elihu arrived and sat with Job but if Job hoped to find in them pity for their friend, he was in that to be disappointed too. These erstwhile friends heaped insulting accusations upon him, adding to his grief the weight of misplaced blame for his misfortunes. Forsaken by God and by man, Job suffered. And what was noteworthy to God in Job's suffering, and what was remarkable to the devil is this, that in all of this, Job never cursed God. Job 1 verse 11, verse 22, in all this, the Bible says, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Mercy. Most of us have trouble controlling our spirit when we do no more than stub our toe. The day Job's trial began was a day like any other day in his life. It was a day that started like every day started for Job. Job would rise early in the morning and worship God. And at his altar, he would faithfully present the offerings he had set aside to cover the sins of his family. And from that altar he would go forward in his day to serve God with honesty and integrity. In every way it was like any other day, but on this day. While sitting at his meal, the world unraveled around him. As Job would put it a little later in the story, he felt God had marked him as an enemy. And Job's lament 
was that he didn't know why. Now before we go into this remarkable story, let's address some of the questions that are sometimes asked. For example, did Abraham know Job? Were they contemporary? After all, I'm placing this story in the Chronicles of Abraham. Now the Job of this story might, in fact, be the son of Issachar by that name, who went into Egypt with Jacob. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 46, verse 13. One argument against this is that Job was a man who lived in Uz, not a man who lived in Goshen. And Uz is not, or was not, in Egypt. If it was anywhere, it's believed it was over in Saudi Arabia. Uz was, <laughs> most likely, in Median. And that's the place where Moses took refuge when he fled from Pharaoh and where he met Jethro, who became his father-in-law, as Jethro gave him Zipporah, his daughter, to be his wife. This is the place, or this is the vicinity in which God met with Moses in the burning bush. It's possible that Uz was in Median. And yet, for at least 80 years, you understand, maybe people, many people miss this, but for at least 80 years, maybe as many as 100 years, Israel lived in Egypt free. They weren't under oppression all the time they were there. In fact, throughout the years of Joseph, they remained free and favored. There's no reason to object to the idea that Issachar's son, who went into Egypt, you know, Issachar is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, and Issachar had a son named Job. That would be the grandson to Jacob. And they went into Egypt together. And there's nothing to get in the way of accepting the idea that this Job grew up and even migrated out of Egypt over into Median, if possible, and became a great man there. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the Jews in Egypt became a mighty people. Very prosperous. They didn't come under oppression and the burden of tyranny and the burden of the taskmasters and all that story didn't start until after Joseph died. And it's more than likely it didn't start until after Levi died, actually. So there's probably 80 to 100 years there where this story could have taken place. Now, some people believe that the name of this city, Uz, was a metaphor. Because we don't know of any city that existed by this name. We can't find it. Nowhere in history do we find any city by this name. We have not been able to dig up any ruins that uh, indicate that a city by this name existed or that a land by this name existed. So they think that maybe this word, us, is a metaphor, and that's interesting because the word us comes from a word that means to take consultation. So some people believe that the name us is used in a metaphor to speak of that place or time in Job's life when God, in consultation with the devil, turned this great judgment and trial upon Job's life. Now, I don't believe that. I don't accept that conclusion. I don't believe there's anything to support it. Um, I believe that us was uh, an actual land where Job lived. And there are a lot of reasons that I go there, but those reasons are in the notes that I give to those of you who were kind enough to register for this series of messages. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so you see, you have to register to get that information. I'm just kidding around. But the, yeah, you can go online and you'll see a place there to register. And if you do, you'll get, you'll get my notes each week as I prepare them. And you'll also have access to a 500-page study on uh, introduction to every book in the Bible. And, and also biblical chronology will also be made available to you. So a lot of goodies if you register. And uh, the reason we're doing that, by the way, is a little aside, a little commercial. You guys deal with it on TV. You can deal with it here. I'm just kidding around. 
But, but let me say, the reason we're doing this, it's not because, you know, something magical happens when you register. You're helping me test my website. So when you do this, you're helping me see how this works and if it works, because we're getting ready to launch a, a kind of Bible institute that's going to be an online institute. And so you're helping with all that. Amen? No? Okay, fine. Let's get back to the message. What do you say? So that's my answer to the question, did Job know Abraham? You said, well, where's your answer? Oh, here it is. I don't know. Nobody knows. We don't really know that for sure. But we do believe he lives somewhere within this period of time. And so I put it here with the Chronicles of Abraham. Who are these sons of God? That's another question that comes up all the time. Job 38 verse 7 makes it very clear that this expression is used for the angels that God created in the beginning. He calls them sons of God. Yet the Bible makes it clear that none of the angels are called the Son of God. You'll see that in Hebrews. Brought up very clearly. Because Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. This is interesting. The word Son does not by itself establish a relationship by birth. All right? Or identify a relationship that is defined by birth relation. It is translated steward, for example, in Genesis 15 verse 2. And elsewhere, it's used to speak of a relationship between a master and a servant, or between an elder and a junior, where there's no birth connection between them. Finally, we notice that when this word is used in a way that does involve a relationship that's established by birth, every time a qualifier is used with it, like begotten son, or he beget a son, or a son was born unto him. My point there is that the word son doesn't mean someone was born of somebody. When that word is used to identify someone born of somebody, other words are used to qualify or clarify that. And so for all these reasons, when we read sons of God, we don't have any problem with it, suggesting that these angels were birthed to God somehow. Because the word son really doesn't even mean that. One day, God's children will be gathered to him in heaven, and we who have been born again in Christ Jesus will be sons of God. The Bible says in John chapter 1, as many as received him, that is Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. But our relationship to our Father is different from the relationship of these sons because we have the qualifier. They were sons of God, but not born to God or birthed to God. We are sons birthed unto God. Amen. Anyway, let's go now to the message. One day, Job's children were all killed, his possessions all robbed, his health gone and sitting in ashes and scraping the itching and in flame boils that covered his body. Job's wife provoked him to curse God and die. And forsaken by God in all mercy or even pity, we may summarize righteous Job's lament. Presented throughout the entire book. Collecting together all of those weeping passages from Job. You might bring them all together and express them in this cry that came from the heart of one more righteous than he, one more innocent than he could ever have claimed to be, one perfectly sinless who suffered at the hands of evil men and cried from the cross we heard sung of just a moment ago, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In fact, there are many parallels between Job's story and the cross of Calvary. Three of Job's friends and a young man named Elihu sat with him for seven days silent. Wow. But if when Job spake, and they waited for him to speak, if when Job did speak up, he had any hope in his heart that these friends had come to actually show him pity, 
Because in one place he says, a friend ought to, ought to expect pity from his friends. He says that later on in his complaint against these so-called friends. If Job expected any pity to come to him from his friends, he was to be disappointed. He was totally orphaned of any mercy. It seemed to him from God or from man. In fact, when these friends began to speak to Job, it wasn't very long in the story where Job says effectively, I wish you guys would just be quiet. The Bible says that Job looked at his friends and he said, Miserable comforters are ye all. In Job 16, verse 2. When you study the friends' statements to Job, you can discern their philosophy, their doctrine, their beliefs. And they believe that because God is just, and of course He is, but that because God is just, therefore God would never ever allow the righteous to suffer as Job was suffering. So they knew there had to be something wrong with Job. Now those of us privileged to live in the light of New Testament truth, we can see perhaps more clearly than they might have been able to see that such a philosophy flies in the face of God. Many people miss this, but when you read their complaints to Job, they keep trying to find him, trying to get him to admit there's something wrong. Go ahead and tell us the secret sin that God is judging here. As that went on and on and on, they didn't realize that they were actually Offending God. Because God was going to send His own Son to suffer and to die at the hands of evil and wicked men on our behalf. You catch what I'm saying? Think about it. Here these guys are saying, no, God would never allow an innocent to suffer. And God is saying, excuse me, my son will suffer at the hands of evil and wicked men. I don't know if you've ever had a situation where someone's telling you what they think of you. <laughs> and you kind of feel like they're building a box around you. You almost feel like they're defining you, putting labels on you. And saying, here's what you are, here's who you are, and and they don't know what they're talking about. If you've ever experienced something like that, of course I have, and in my position, I, you know, I get that kind of thing more often than perhaps the average guy does. People who think they understand you and they don't. People who criticize you, accuse you of things, that they don't know what they're talking about. But you can imagine, if you've ever been in that experience, you, you know what I mean, you, you just you, you chafe against that kind of thing and it, it riles you up a little bit and you don't like it. You ought not to like it. It's not right. I can imagine God just breaking out of that box. In fact, he breaks out of that box when you come to the end of this book. He turns to those three friends and he says, if, if my servant Job does not present an offering to cover you, you're dead. <laughs> he was not happy with these miserable comforters of Job. And what did he say? Because you have not spoken that which is truth concerning me as my servant Job has. What would make God so personal about this? What would stir up such a personal and intense reaction to what's going on here? I'll tell you what it was. How dare you? My own innocent, sinless, and perfect son is going to suffer way beyond anything that has come upon Job. How dare you say that I wouldn't do something like that? That's exactly what I'm going to do. The innocent is going to suffer for the guilty. The sinless is going to take the punishment of the sinful. Although Job's doctrine was in all points like theirs on anything related to God's glory or His majesty, His goodness, His mercy. If you go through this book, and obviously we don't have time to read all 42 chapters together. 
But if you go through this book, you will hear over and over again, Job will say something like, yeah, I know. They'll go on and on and on and on about God is great and is glorious and he's wonderful and he's righteous and he's good and the wicked are going to suffer and the wicked are going to be judged and God's going to be righteous and God's going to judge them and they go on and on and on and on like that and then finally the guy gets quiet long enough for Job to speak up and you can almost imagine Job looking up, sitting there in his ashes and with weariness in his eyes and his tone saying something like, and I don't mean to be trivial, but I do want to make a point. Saying something like, uh-huh, no, duh. Like I didn't know that. He often tells him stuff like, you think I didn't know that? There's a profound insight in here, and the whole idea of this Know Your Bible Insights is to bring some insights out of these stories that will be interesting to you and helpful. There's a Profound insight. Really not buried there. You just got to look a little while to see it. At the end of this story, as promised by James, we see God's pity and mercy was in truth never removed from Job. But in fact, the whole ordeal was God revealing something about his mercy and his justice and his goodness. He had never removed these things from Job but was in this story and through this story revealing the very things his friends could not see in Job's story. But hopefully you'll go home with clear vision on what was, just go what was going on here in this story. And in the end, God rebuked not Job, but his miserable comforters because they failed to see God as Job saw him. They failed to recognize his sovereignty. They failed to humble themselves to his hand in trusting submission to his will, even when it doesn't make sense. And that reminds us of Jesus again. When in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Not my will, but thine be done. <clears throat> now in the commentary section of this study... I'm not going to go through verse by verse, all 42 chapters, so I just zeroed in on critical things you need to understand to get the insight I'm going to bring forward concerning Job. So the first main thing you've got to know about Job to appreciate what God is doing in his story and something you need to understand to help you understand what God is doing in yours. It starts right here with the story of Job. Job was not at fault. There are always those friends that gather to this story and sit with those miserable comforters and try to examine the story and discern, there's some pride in Job. That's what it was about. God was trying to humble Job and get him out of his pride. And, and Job, uh, you know, Job had this problem. Or there was some secret sin. Or on and on and on it goes. And it really is actually very disturbing. And unhappily, it causes those people, those commentators I've read, I don't know how many. And it causes every single one of them to miss the point of the book. You know, Charles Dickens' famous opening to his Christmas carol always comes to mind when I contemplate the opening chapters of the book of Job. Dickens wrote, quote, Marley was dead to begin with. And then, this must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. Similarly, unless it is understood distinctly that Job was righteous. In fact, God said he was perfect. And all the friends of Job, all the miserable comforters, have to pull out their hermeneutical toolbox and open it up and find their scripture resting wrenches and pull them out and work those verses to leave some kind of an opening for, no, God had to be punishing Job for something. Listen, Job admitted that he was a sinner. 
When we get into it in a moment, you'll be amazed at how advanced was Job's understanding of the New Testament. <laughs> he had remarkable advanced insight into justification and all of these doctrines. Job's argument was, listen, why wouldn't you pardon me? Why wouldn't you just forgive me? That wasn't the reason. Job knew that wasn't the reason he was going through what he suffered. He knew there wasn't some sin God was going after. He didn't understand what was going on, but he knew that wasn't it. And unless you understand and accept God's testimony concerning Job, you cannot get God's message through the book of Job. So let's look at what God said about it. Open your Bible to Job 1 verse 1. <clears throat> Here's what God said. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Well, that's a pretty good resume. What would you, what, what, what do you think? And this business that he eschewed evil is a little puzzling to some people. What it basically means is he had contempt for it. He would, as it were, spit it from his mouth. He was disgusted by it. You want, you want to know one reason some of you in this room right now have trouble overcoming temptation and sin is because you have too much sympathy for it. When you're in trapped or you're struggling with a temptation, your response to it is, oh, how hard this is because, and really, it's, you have sympathy for yourself. Oh, I can't, this is too hard for me. You have too much sympathy for it. You have too much sympathy for the sin that's tempting you. And too much sympathy for yourself in it. The point this verse is making is that Job wasn't wired that way. Job was the kind of guy that when those sorts of things came up, he went, I hate that. Interesting, isn't it? He was a remarkable man, that's to be sure. Look at verse number 8 in the same chapter. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Now the first verse, well, that was just the Holy Ghost telling us something about Job. But verse 8, now, that's God talking. You know I'm being facetious. God is telling us that Job was a perfect man. That means he was complete and entire. He was not lacking in anything in his relationship with God, including this. He recognized he was a sinner, and he presented the, the uh, prerequisite or the requisite offerings to address that issue. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Bible's not saying Job was a sinless man. The Bible is saying that Job was a man who dealt with his sin according to what God told him to do about it. That's what the Bible is telling us. Look at chapter 2, verse number 3. This is after now the world has been dropped upon Job and everything's been taken from him up to this point except his health and next his health is going to be taken from him. But in chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Now look, not without purpose. God had a purpose in all of this. What is very important to understand about the book of Job, before you get into this book, or you will not get the message of this book, you must understand that what happened to Job did not happen because of any fault in Job. Amen. God goes out of his way three times to make that point. The reason I emphasize it right now and kind of fuss about it is because I can't find a commentator out there anywhere who gets it. None of them. They all find fault with Job. 
Every single one of those rascals sit there in judgment of Job. And the minute you sit there in judgment of Job, you've just missed the book. You missed the whole point of it. According to God, this came upon Job without cause. Now that can be a little scary. That's very scary to anybody who doesn't trust God. Listen, talk about insight. Listen, listen to the one. You're going to get one right now. This scares people who want to keep control of whether or not they get in trouble. They want to control whether or not they have trials and tribulations in their life. They want it to be based on their own righteousness because they imagine foolishly and vainly that they can be righteous enough to avoid getting into this kind of problem. There's an insidious working of self-righteousness in the mind of those who cannot accept the sovereign right of God to do what He wants to do, when He wants to do it, any way He wants to do it, with anybody He wants to do it with, and anyhow He wants to do it. There's just something in us that says, no, 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 I can't turn that over to God. i got to keep it. i got to hang on to it myself. It's got to be about me. It's got to be about what I did. It's got to be about what I do. If it's true that God can just do whatever, <gasps> you don't trust God. Let me tell you something right now. You'd be a whole lot better off trusting God than you will trusting in your own righteousness. That's part of the message of Job. You need to trust God, not your own righteousness. Job knew God very well. The friends of Job couldn't see God clearly. The friends' view of God and their knowledge of redemption, arguably, by the way, the nearest truths of the heart of God you can find in the Bible, as compares with Job's, shows an amazing advanced insight on the part of Job and surprising ignorance and dullness on the part of his friends. Although most commentators will read the arguments of his friends and say, oh, they're right. They haven't read deeply enough. They're not paying attention to what's going on in the story. But to make it simple for any of us, just in case you get a little lost in those, you read Bildad or you read Zophar and you read Eliphaz and they sound like they're saying all the things that you believe. If you have that problem, go to the last chapters and watch how God, what God thinks about what they said. Not that they said the wrong things about who God is and what He is. They just didn't get something. They didn't understand one fundamental basic truth. And we're going to give it to you at the end of this message, so hang on. There are many examples of this. For example, Bildad says, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will He help the evildoer. Bildad certainly saw occasions when the innocent suffered and the wicked prospered. Have you ever noticed that? Of course you've seen cases like that. You've seen times where uh, wicked men seem to be doing well. And guys that live very righteous and holy lives seem to be doing poorly. We've all noticed that in this world. Bildad certainly saw that. But listen, Bildad's doctrine about God, see, didn't have room for that. Now listen. Though in man's estimation, his doctrine about God was indeed lofty. His doctrine of God, his understanding of who God is, failed to comprehend all of the truth about him and all, about the, and all of the truth about life. Job, on the other hand, he wouldn't be a respecter of persons. You ought to go back and you ought to go through this and read it and notice how Job accuses these friends of being respecters of persons with God. This is an amazing insight. Watch. Job is listening to these guys go on and on and on. And Job's reaction is, well, you're going to be a respecter of persons with God? Wait a minute, what does this mean? Job is saying, what, you're going to, you're going to pervert justice and pervert judgment and condemn me 
out of your respect for God. Whoa. This is a profound book. You got to listen now to what I'm saying. Job didn't disagree with what Bildad and Zophar and Eliphaz said about God. Job was saying, what you believe about God, I also believe about God. But what you're doing is you're closing your eyes to the reality of this moment right now. Because in this moment right now, there is an innocent man suffering, not for anything he did. Right now in front of you, there is a man who will hold to his own integrity. In fact, he says, you're not going to take my integrity from me. I know that I didn't do anything worthy of this that's come upon me. And I'm not going to lie just to make God look good. Ooh, what an amazing thing. Listen, I know, I know this is kind of a, a subtle insight, so I, I figure I've got to work it a little bit, so listen carefully. Again, Job is not objecting to what they said about God. Job is saying, you can't take what is true about God and then hide from what's true in front of you right now. A lot of people do that. They have just enough knowledge of truth sometimes, but they don't really comprehend it, but they've got, just a, they've got a set of facts and things they believe, and they bend everything else to fit it. In other words, these guys had a doctrinal view of God that Job didn't fit into. Job believed the same things they did. Here's the difference. Job said, God doesn't need me to, to sort things out for him. I don't need to defend God. God will defend himself. He actually says that a couple of times in his, in his laments. God doesn't need me or need you to, to, to justify him. You don't need to condemn me to justify God. You get it? Their doctrinal ideas about God put them in a position where Job's story didn't fit into that box. And so they just decided, you've got to be something wrong with you. Because there's no way God would do this. Well, you know what? Job felt the same way about things. But how did Job respond to it? You know what Job did? Job lived with the contradiction. He submitted himself to it. He said, look, I don't get it. Over and over again, I don't know what God's doing here. I don't understand this. I, I would, he'd just go ahead and kill me. I don't know why he doesn't. That's what Job is saying. I don't get it. But here's what I know for sure. I know God is good, and God is merciful, and God is righteous, and God can do whatever he wants to do. I know that. And I know I didn't do anything wrong. That's how much I know. That's good, isn't it? Sometimes we need to just understand that we're not going to understand. Come on. Sometimes we just need to understand that we're not going to understand it. And we're going to have to submit to it anyway because we trust God. Job's level of trust in God is amazing. It's unshakable. In the midst of all this, he says, Yet I know that in my flesh I shall see him. In the midst of all this, is I know my Redeemer liveth. And we're in the last day, stand upon this land and stuff like that. It, it's just incredible that Job would not allow the contradiction he was experiencing between what he believed about God and what he was experiencing in this world. He didn't allow that to cause him to do either deny the truth he knew about God or to deny the truth he knew he was living. Don't go into fantasy world and start pretending everything's okay. You're sick. You took James 5 seriously. You went before God and you begged him to heal you. Don't go around telling people you're healed while you're dying. Because by faith, I just know that I am. Why don't you just tell the truth? I asked God to heal me, but I'm dying. That doesn't mean God's not truth. And, and neither does it mean I'm not dying. 
You get what I'm trying to say? Sometimes you live with these contradictions. You just live with them. You let God sort it out in the end. And He does, doesn't He? He will sort it out in the end. He said to them, Ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. He says, Will ye speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for Him? I tell you, some Christians get into this. Their own life experience seems to come into just stark contradiction to everything that they have believed about God that they just go into a fantasy world and start pretending things are this way and things are that way when they're not. Live in the truth. You don't give up, you don't take your experiences and then contradict the Bible with them. And you don't take the Bible and contradict your experiences with them. When situations like that arise in your life, you just trust God. Amen. Like Job did. You trust Him. You just trust Him and go on. And watch what God does. And it'll be amazing to you when He works it all out. You can consider Job's advanced insight. And they're all over the place. But I like this one. Well, the problem is I like the one I'm looking at the time I'm looking at it. And I'm looking at this one right now, so let's, you know, this one is just amazing. Listen to this. Job 19, 25 and 27. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. In other words, I know I'm saved. I know my Redeemer has redeemed me. I know I'm born again. I know the Holy Ghost has sealed me unto the day of redemption. I know those things are true. I know the day will come when I will rise again. I will be given a glorified body like unto His glorious body, and I will see Him face to face. I know that's true. No matter what happens here, I know that's true. Amen? That's what carried Job through his trial. And that's what will carry us through ours. Now as I come to conclusion, I remember when my dad said to me, Jerry, I don't think we fully appreciate the relationship between God and Satan. There's something going on between those two that we don't understand. He said that after he had read the book of Job. Because here you have a, an amazing story where this man is living a per perfect life. He's doing everything he's supposed to do. He's a sinner, but he addressed the sin issue according to what God told him to do. He did everything he was supposed to do. If, if he sinned, the Bible says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he did that. You get, I'm trying to bring it into your, where you're living. He did that. He did all of those things he's supposed to do. And God is having a conversation with Satan of all people. And God is the one who picks the argument. God says, hey Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? I mean, if you're Job, you're like, thanks a lot. <laughs> like putting this great big target on my back. Thank you. But God didn't need to do that because God already, I mean, Satan already had noticed Job. And basically, you know what, Job, what Satan said? I can't get to him. Obviously, he had tried many times. He said, I can't get to him. You've got a hedge about him. I can't get at him. And then Satan made an accusation. He's the accuser, you know, of the beloved, of the brethren. And so he made an accusation against Job. And he said, if you remove that hedge and let me at him, I'll tell you what, he's going to curse you to your face. And God said, you're on. I'll let you add him, but you can't take his life. You can't touch his body at this point. And he did that, not because he saw something in Job that provoked him, 
against him. That's not why he did it. There's something going on between God and Satan that we don't understand. There's something about that relationship that we're a party to and that it does affect us in a very direct way, but that we're not a party to, in a sense. Something going on between them. And we can explore that and offer some insight and suggestions, but we're not going to go there right now. So I read the book. I had read it already many times before that, but then I read it with a new fascination. I read it very carefully and began to read it. I read it well over a hundred times. And I would say that Job is indeed a remarkable man. And this is a remarkable challenge. And he endured a remarkable trial. And his patience was indeed remarkable. But what's the message of Job's story? When you get to the end of the story of Job in chapter number 42, you see something amazing. Look at it with me. Job 42. After Job went all through this misery, finally God shows up. And it's so amazing because here's this man sitting in ashes, scraping the boils, the inflamed boils on his body. I mean, this man is in misery and he's put up with these irritating, insulting friends who are just heaping insult on top of his misery. I mean, you talk about adding insult to injury. This is like the definition of that, what he had to put up with with these guys. And so God steps in, and the first thing God says, listen, is this, Job, get to your feet. Excuse me? Stand up. I don't know about you, but that just absolutely breaks my heart. Not for Job. Not, not in the sense of, how oh, mean, God. No. The respect, the honor that God insisted upon from that man is just amazing to me. You know what impressed God about Job through that whole thing? He told Satan this. Have you noticed? He still got his integrity. Have you noticed? He's still got his integrity. You haven't been able to break his integrity. That impressed God. God comes down to that servant sitting in those ashes. And God says, son, stand to your feet. Stand up. Get up out of those ashes. Stand up in front of me, son. And you can see old Job struggling to get up. Standing there covered head to toe with boils. Standing before his heavenly father. And you know what father does? Dresses him down. Boy, where were you when I made the worlds? Son, were you there when I put Pleiades in the sky and I did all this stuff? Were you there when I abandoned Orion? Son, can you handle Leviathan? Interesting, isn't it? I think most people reading this would feel like, God, you're being so unkind to Job. I think God is honoring that man amazingly. It's awesome to me. But this man's got integrity. Now watch what God does. Watch what Job does finally. After all this is done. Job's gone through all this. Look at chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord. And said. I know that thou canst do everything. And you might think that he's saying here. That I know you have enough of power. To do all kinds of really neat things. Tricky things. That's not what he's saying. What Job is saying here is this. I acknowledge you do whatever you want to do. Whenever you want to do it. Whatever way you want to do it. And when you want to do it. You have absolute total sovereign power. 
to effect whatever cause you want to bring to be and to do whatever thing you want to do. And he goes on to say this. No thought can be withholden from thee. Now this gets a little deeper because I can go into some things that God said that actually explored the thoughts of Job. But we can't, I don't have time to go into that, but it's really amazing. And then he says, Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Now listen to this. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Whoa, the faith of this man. It's unbelievable. He's talking to God. And after all this, he says, I will demand of thee, now speak thou to me. And then he says this. This verse 5 is very important. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. I knew you by hearing, but now I know you in my, in my experience. Through this ordeal, I see you more clearly than I've ever seen you before. How many of you would say that you've gone through a time of suffering and trial and you came out of it and you see God more clearly? Yeah, me too. But get this next thing and then we're done. Wherefore, verse 6, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Repent? Repent of what? What does he repent of? Here's the major insight of this book. When we think of repentance, we think of repenting for this or that thing that we did. We don't understand when you really get worked over in repentance and you come to where repentance is intended really to take you finally, it's here. Repent for what you are beyond what you did. Job had covered all the things he did in the way God told him to cover those with those offerings that he was giving. But Job came to that place in his life where he recognized something the other boys failed to see. God is who he is and we are who we are. And when he saw God for who he is, then all of a sudden he saw him for what and who he was. And he said, Wow. I abhor myself. I loathe myself. What did Jesus try to get across to us over and over and over again? If you love this life, you're going to lose it. If you hate this life, you're going to find it. If you're going to follow me, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Right? Over and over and over again, Jesus tried to drill that into our mind and into our heart. We need to get this message. God is who he is. And when you see God for who he is, then you're going to see yourself for what and who you are. That's right. And that's going to move a repentance at a level and a depth you've never experienced before. And then you'll rise to greater glory than ever possible before. Unhappily, we just now got to the outline of the message. And my time is gone. Yeah, right. I appreciate you, Doug. But let me just give you the outline and we're done. The heavens rule. The message of Job. The heavens rule. Amen. God is sovereign. Does what he wants. The heathen rage. And that's what Satan was trying to get Job to do. I will provoke him to rage against you. And that's what Satan's trying to do in your life. The same trial that God means to deepen your humility and so by that to deepen your connection with him, the same thing God does in your life to that end, Satan is doing to another end. You guys are aware my microphone's gone? The heavens rule. No, I'm back. The heavens rule. God is sovereign, does what he wants. The heathen rage. That's what Satan wanted Job to do. And that's what Satan's trying to get you to do when you go through trials and tribulations. He's trying to get you to rage. But the humble will rise. 
If in your trial and tribulation you'll humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, then God will lift you up. And that's the glorious message of Job. Let's stand together, please. All right. Let's respond to our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what kind of thing you're going through, but I know this about life. You are either just not coming out of a trial or you're getting ready to go into one. Amen? Amen? Those of us who live longest were the earliest to say amen. Yeah, it's true. You're either going into a trial or you've just come out of one. Or you're in the middle of one. There's the third option. There are three, actually. You might be in the middle of one right now. Remember the story of Job. Remember this message. The heavens rule. Submit to that. Satan, he wants you to rage. God wants you to humble yourself. The fastest way through your trial and to victory is when you humble yourself in the trial. Please remember that. Let's respond to God as we go into the invitation and conclude the service this morning. Just respond any way the Lord leads you. You can kneel where you are, come up here to pray, bow your head to pray, however the Spirit leads you. But let's respond to God.